from there, from there in high school, you know, I, you know, still going back to school, I was doing these pep rallies. Dr. Martin was let us use this equipment. And so we were getting ready for one performance and I was outside in front of my apartment, trying to get some guys together so we could do a performance at school. And I knew only one of the other guys could sing a little bit. And the other two guys, they were just trying to get girls. And they were, <laughs> they were ladies men around campus. They, you know, they were playboys, as I call them. And I'm like, yo, we got to have two of those in our group. You know, so we'll get the girls like, ah, oh, Tracy, you can dance this here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I thought that would be fun. And one day this guy, these two guys, they drove by and saw us outside dancing and practicing. And that guy named was Tyrone Wilson and Cameron his partner, they were in a group, but they were older than us. They were in their 20s, of course, out of high school and all that stuff. And they've been yeah. writing songs and producing and doing that stuff. So they came over and they asked, they was like, hey, um, you guys are a group? And we got, like, yes, we're practicing for a little uh, pet rally in my school. And that day was the day that changed my life. So they asked us to sing. And I knew the other guys in the group could sing or harmonize together. <laughs> but they could definitely lip sync to the tracks and dance extremely well. But um, at that point, they took my number down and they called me and it was like, hey, we want you to be in our group. And I was like, really? I was like, yeah. It was like, yeah. And they, I didn't care about the age, you know. And at that point, Tyrone gave me my first shot at recording in a studio. Yeah. So we went to this recording studio. I heard myself on a microphone on a recording for the first time. And I was like, woof, I don't sound that good. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. when you sing out loud and you're like, oh my gosh, I sound pretty awesome. Yeah. At this point, after recording, I was like, oh, I don't sound as good as I thought I did. I could sing and hold a note, but yeah. I knew I needed a lot of work. And I had a lot of confidence. So me and Ty and the group that he started, which we called ourselves Tracy Ray. And I still don't know why they would call ourselves <laughs> Tracy Ray because nobody was named Tracy. Nobody <laughs> was named C. Wilson Cameron, but Ray, my name ain't Ray Ray. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't know why that, still to this day, why that was called that. But we, we would rehearse and me and Ty were the strongest singers of the group. Um, we got another guy in later on. We was constantly trying to find a fourth guy, but we could never find anybody that strong. And in the group, we would do these performances. I knew Tyrone could sing and play the piano and produce really well. I could write and arrange really well. And we wrote songs together. We would go out and do these local performances around town, which was cool. But a lot of times it would be last minute. Let's do it last minute. It takes me back to church when I would go to church and they were like, okay, learn this song like 30, 45 minutes. It was that type of stuff. But I knew in order for us to go to the next level, I felt like we need to put in time. Mm. If you want to be best, just watching how New Edition did it in their videos or interviews or magazines, I knew that we need to spend a lot of time. So when we come out, we will be clean. We will be strong. We will be up there with them. And then Boys to Men came out. Then Jodeci okay. came out this time, like late 80s, you know, early 90s at this yeah. point. And when they came out, we were like, these dudes got amazing harmonies. Jodeci's got all this crazy soul. It was insane. So we started covering their songs along with, before then, I had already started shifting my sound from studying Ralph Tresvent to Bobby Brown to studying Aaron Hall of God. Okay. And by me working with Ty, Ty, Tyrone Wilson, he introduced me to this guy named Charlie Wilson of the Gap Band. He's he, like, let me introduce you, to, I mean, to his music, not like, say, his, his Charlie. Music. Yes, okay, 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 so when I say okay. introduced me to him, that's what I mean. Into okay. the world of you need to listen to this singer. You need because to because that's where Aaron was really going. That's where Aaron Aaron, Aaron, yes. Aaron was going for that particular sound or had yeah. been studying him for a long time. But I didn't know much about Charlie Wilson. I've heard a couple things, you know, burn rubber on me from my aunt's house from the gap band, but I didn't yep. put two and two together. Yeah. When you look at the records, you just say, okay, that's the gap band. Not this is Charlie Wilson of the, of the gap, gap band. Yeah. You know, as a kid, because once again, my world was limited to, you know, I couldn't be in them records like that. Or else I got in trouble. Yeah. So Tyrone introduced me to the gap band, um, Stevie Wonder, who I knew about, but to be honest with you, I wasn't that big of a Stevie Wonder fan. 
And it was possibly because I couldn't really sing Stevie's songs at that time. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to sing them or to approach them like that. You know, and not saying that Charlie Wilson isn't that strong, but yo, it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he introduced me to that world of Charlie Wilson, started doing that. People started saying, yo, you sound like Uncle Charlie. You sound like this person. And I was like, that's great that they can say that. But here I am. I want to be able to have my own sound. And I just didn't know how to cultivate that at the okay. time. But by studying other singers, which is mm. part of, you know, you know, an exchange of put adding some of their their um, their talents or tricks or whatever, their style into yeah. my own, which is developing into this different thing, yeah, mm. which later on became me. Yeah. I mean, so in, in, in those early days, then, so you, you're hearing yourself on, on a record for the first time and then you, you, you're, you're perfecting your vocal, your range and everything. Um, but you also mentioned that, you, you know, you've got a young family and you're still in that young page. And then I'm wondering, though, if you, you've got a baby to feed, a sort of family to support, are you then finishing school, then thinking go to college? Or are you thinking I need to get some income coming in? Or am well, I thinking about becoming, going to sign for Uptown? What, what was, how did that happen? Well, at that time, I was, uh, like I said, I was singing and doing little shows with Ty. In while, the Orlando area. In the Orlando area, while working at Wendy's. Oh, at Wendy's. While working at Albertsons as a okay. grocery bagger. Yeah, working there. Uh, I had worked at several different weird jobs, Subway, you know. And then mm -hmm. my girlfriend that I was dating and we had kids, we, at this point, we had our second child. Wow. You know, and she's working at Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. The night shift. Um, she would go in like 7, 8, get off at 6 or 7 in the morning. Wow. And I'll be working at Wendy's, working until close and then get off, blah, 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 blah. And I knew I could no longer continue to work at Wendy's, but I still did. I picked up working another shift at Dunkin' Donuts. And we went over to sing at um, Jack the Rapper's office, the group um, Tracy Ray with Tyrone Wilson. And when we went in there, we were already had a lot of friction with each other because I was very upset with them because we weren't practicing as much as we needed to be better. And at that point, I, they had their own lives. You know, I had my own life. They had their own doing their thing. Mm -hmm. But I knew I needed to make some changes. I got two kids and one on the way. Oh, wow. Yeah. How old were you by this time? At this time, I was eight, 17, 18. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was young, very young. And... Mm -hmm. And you're still thinking you want to take this career full time. I have to. Wow. By me not doing this, there's no options left. I can't take care of my children and my girlfriend at the time with the kind of income we were bringing in. I needed to do something. And because I felt like we weren't getting to this next level, we were trying some things. Ty had a connection with this lady named Dr. Quinn, who was a dentist and outside skirts, a place called Sanford, outside skirts of uh, Orlando. And she had a recording studio in the building of her dentist office. So not, not hers, but in, in her dentist office. It wasn't her recording studio. Yes, it was. Oh, okay. That's a she strange... Had a dentist, she had a dentist office, a dentist <laughs> practice, okay. which was in the front half of the, her building. Yeah. And in the back half, she had took equipment out and built a recording studio in a room in the back. Now, why, outside why? that door, she had other dentist chairs here. Yeah, so she was wanting to get in, get in the music industry as well. Okay, as yeah. a dentist normally does. <laughs> as a dentist, yes. So Dr. Quinn was amazing because she, she loved music like that, and she really had an ear and an eye for talent. So... We would be over there and she set up a meeting one time with this girl group, which was from a girl from my high school. Start, she started a group who wound up being a DJ for a radio station. Her name was April D. And her husband was is a, still a DJ at one of the radio stations in Orlando, which is crazy. So she signed, she worked with them, did a production deal with them. She was working with my group, you know, and so she so she set up a meeting with us in this studio with a guy that she was doing dental work on who was the roadie 
for New Kids on the Block, who is also the roadie for this group called um, Snap. I got the power. Yeah, 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 yeah. So his name is Johnny Wright. So Johnny Wright used to come over there in a Neo, a Geo Tracker, blue Geo Tracker, <laughs> hmm. while he was the road manager for them. And then over the years, he turned into that Geo Tracker into a BMW green car. So he was moving up in the music industry. Hmm. And he had told us at her studio that, hey, look, um, the music industry goes in cycles of 10, 10 years. Every 10 years, you know, ain't nothing hasn't been replayed already. It's going to be replayed again. Revisit it. Boy bands are going to come back again in 10 years. And at that time, New Kids on the Block was kind of going down, you know, mm. their, their success. Yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. Down. And we was like, yeah, all right, whatever. You're just doing all this talk. But he was the closest thing to success in the music industry that we were could sit down and chat with at this time. Mm. So at this point, you know, Ty and all of us would do these little small performances, but they were never really panning out like that. You know what I'm saying? So we mm. did a, this meeting at Jack the Rapper, Jack the Rapper's office. They listened to us, listened to us perform, even brought us up to the Jack the Rapper convention, but we never really got to perform there, but just to see how it worked here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Got back home and I was like, something's got to change. I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I got to make some decisions. So that night they took all of our numbers down and they called me and they said, look, we want to work with you. We don't want to work with the rest of the guys in the group. At that point, I was devastated because I knew I had to make some decisions, you know, based off of my children, based off of if I'm really going to do this music thing, being that I already given up college, you know mm. what I'm saying? I need to make some decisions. And I went over with the guy that we had. We had two guys that was managing the group. You know, this guy named Vince Williams and a guy named Mike Berry. And me and Mike Berry, we were pretty close. Vince was pretty close with Ty and the other guys because mm. I guess because of his writing capabilities and all that other stuff. And so I was like, okay, look, um, the guys from Jack the Rapper, they called me, they want to do a solo project with me. And, and they got mad, uh, fight broke out, you know, and it wasn't cool. It wasn't, it wasn't good. And I told them, I was like, look, I'm gonna, I, I need to take this opportunity, but if I can bring you guys in on a couple of records, I want to do that and honor you guys and do that because we had wrote some records together and mm -hmm. we wound up using one song called Give It A Try that me and Ty wrote and we were able to put that on the album. Okay. Yeah, but it wasn't a good time. I felt like they were like brothers to me, but I had to make that decision. Yeah. Was I happy with it? No, but I had to. Yeah. So what they, they, so they wanted to sign you up and, uh, for a solo deal yep. and, but at this point then, did they, did you know what it, what a solo deal was? Did you understand points? Did you understand contracts or did you just I did saw? Not, I had no idea of points or contract. I didn't know any of that. So I you didn't. signed the dotted line and just says, okay, I'm going to be a recording but artist. It wasn't that, it wasn't that quick. You okay. know, they gave the contracts and my mom, she worked for Westinghouse at the time, which became Siemens, who she stayed with, which was her only job. Well, not only, but her final job, right? And she was used to dealing with contracts and stuff like that. She wasn't a lawyer, but yeah. she didn't watch a lot of law shows. <laughs> L.A. Law and stuff, okay. Yeah, right. She would watch all of that crime shows. And, <laughs> and she would be on it, man. And when she saw the contract, she said, you're never signing this. Wow. And I was like, Mama, I have to sign this in order to move forward on this. I don't, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but this is my only way at this point to make some noise or to try and get into this industry thing. Now, mind you, before I did that deal, I had my, my I forget who I was around, but somebody asked me to sing something for my mom and it wasn't gospel. And I was like, I can never sing anything that's not gospel around my mother. Mm -hmm. And I guess because of where our relationship was and I had left home early and all that stuff, I think she was willing to listen. And she did. And she was like, oh my gosh, you really got something. Mm -hmm. Let's go downtown Orlando. And they had this little place where you can, they had a green screen 
and you could sing to karaoke tracks and make little, little small videos yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And I did Jeff's Red song, I Found Lovin'. <laughs> okay, okay. And it's funny, my mom passed this year. She gave me this, she left me this crate and it has that video in my garage right now wow. with that video, which is funny. But that was her, her way of saying, I support you. I believe in you, you know? Mm -hmm. So when she read this contract, she was like, you, you should not sign this contract. But I was like, mama, I got, I got two kids and one possibly on the way right now. I was like, me working at the donut shop is not going to get it. Me doing all this other stuff is not going to get it. I got some guys that I feel like believe in me and what I, I can do. I really need to do this. It could change my life and, mm -hmm. and some of the people around me. And she's like, all right. Yeah, but I'm warning you, you shouldn't. And I signed it. I got a $5,000 advance. I've never had that much money in my life mm -hmm. at one time. Yeah. And I was staying in the hood. And so I took my girlfriend and our kid, two, ki two daughters, and moved us into a townhome, which was really nice in the, in the area where we stayed at. And I paid the rent all the way up, and we didn't have to worry about that. And at that point, I quit working at the donut shop. I was screwing up the donuts anyway. <laughs> that wasn't for me. <laughs> Uh, you tell me five thousand dollars could go that far. <laughs> Listen, for me, I was get we were getting food stamps, man. Okay. We were getting government assistance. And what man wants to be proud of that? You yeah. know, so five thousand dollars back in in was that ninety, ninety one? Yo, it was not ninety, yeah, nine ninety one, ninety two. This is ninety two. Okay. And I was able to use that money to get us out of a neighborhood that was going down, you know, and put us in a nice um, townhome. Yeah. Okay. We had three bedrooms, you know. So my thing was, let's do that. And I can take care of them. Then I can go to the studio every night and grind it out just like that. And that's what mm. happened. And then they brought me to Atlanta to work with a producer by the name of Kevin uh, Kendricks who was a part of Cameo, and he was also he also worked with Madonna. At that time, he was putting together, working with a, some young ladies by the name of Escape, which Jermaine Dupri winded up signing at that time. Okay. So I came up here writing with him for a minute, then went back to Orlando, and I was like, okay, I've got this deal. Uh, there's a lot of friction between me and Tracy Ray, so I can't write songs with them and try and bring them on board. So if anything happens with me, we already have an album done and we could do it together. You know what I'm saying? So that was out of the question. But my brother was putting together a group. And so I started writing songs for his group. And I wrote this song called Foreplay for his group. Hmm. And it's so funny. I was a big R. Kelly and in, in the public announcement fan. Yeah, Matt, yeah, yeah. R. Kelly and the public announcement fan at this time. And he had this song called Vibe and yeah, yeah, yeah. all these songs. And, and so my brother's group would perform some of his songs in talent shows, Honey Love, all that stuff. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. thought this dude was incredible. And he was, and, and he basically took Aaron Hall and Marvin Winans' style. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I felt. But I still loved him. I was a fan of his. Yeah. Uh, not his personal life. Yeah, but, yeah, no, like, but as a singer, as the yeah. Artist, yeah, the artist, yeah. Writer, musician, everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I had a lot of, lot of respect for him and as far as his music is concerned. Yeah. But with that being said, um, at that time, oh gosh, <laughs> I got so much stuff going on in my head. <laughs> yeah, but at that time, it was like, um, I, I came back home, wrote this song for my brother's group called Foreplay. And I was like, hey, I want y'all to hear some songs that I, I, I wrote for my brother's group. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, your brother? You got a brother that sang too? I was like, yeah. Yeah, and he plays piano and, and his group. Here's a song I wrote for his group. And I want y'all to check it out. You know, maybe they can, we can do it together or whatever. So they came up to the studio. And my mind, and I'm like, okay, we get something popping. For me, I can get my brother's group and we can all go on tour together and I'll have a family on the road. Yeah, yeah. So I play this song for play for, for them. And they were like, whoa, you wrote that? I'm like, yeah, I told y'all I write and come up with melodies. This is my thing. And at that point, it was like, all right, cool. Everybody go home, da, 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 da. I got in the car with Lewis. Lewis was like, look, 
you need to do this song for you. We can get your brother's group to feature on the record with you, but you need to do that song, just like that. So they got me with this um, guy who I had already met named Fight Wren, who plays keys. And at that time, he was definitely a better uh, keyboard or piano player than my brother was. Mm. You know, my brother was just, you know, you know, church cat was still dope. Yeah, you know, yeah. but there was a lot that he needed to learn about song structure and all that. And Fight mm. had all of that stuff. And then he got CC Lemonhead to do the drum track, tr drum, drum, drums for the track as well. CC was um, a, a really big person as far as bass music is concerned. So he was really dope at putting tracks together like that. So he layered it with that. And mm. we had Foreplay, which was my biggest single at that point. And, and this was released on what, what, what record label? Records. Yeah, okay. yeah, so the guys, Louis Bell and Barry Dufay, instead of managing me at that point, they was like, okay, we got something. So instead of shopping it to the label, they had, they shopped it to labels and they were getting some interest and then a lot that they weren't. Yeah. And they winded up, they had a relationship with the program director of 102 Jams and that guy's name was Cedric Hollywood. Cedric Hollywood listened to the record. He was like, yo, y'all got something. And this guy that ran the Quiet Storm at nighttime, I think it was like 10 to 2 or something like that, his name was Bruce Bebop. He played the song just to test it on the Quiet Storm. And I remember the first time I heard it, I was in that townhouse with my girlfriend, and we were all screaming like crazy, like, oh, my God, <laughs> the song's on the radio. And then people just kept requesting it, requesting it, requesting it. It went crazy. Mm. And then the record just took off. And then, so at that point, instead of them being management, they was like, okay, we're just going to start our own label. And they called it Rip It Records. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So did you record a full album with them? Because I know... Um, full album that's titled You're the One. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because there was um, there went, um, a DJ out of the, U uh, out of the UK, Stevie St um, Sex said when I turned on, I was going to interview, he said, what happened to your debut album on Rip It Records? That, did, did it get released? Yeah. It did. Yeah, the debut album did get released. It, it released in 94. Yeah, titled You're the One. Yeah, the whole album. Okay. But yeah, then so the single, dropped, the single dropped in on August the 11th, and we premiered it at Jack the Rapper Music Convention, but it didn't get released to the record stores until October. It was just taken off so fast, and with it being an independent label, we didn't. they didn't have the funds to kind of roll it out so i guess they had to borrow the money to actually get it out there yeah, yeah so about wondering because back in those days i mean it's not like <clears throat> as an independent how were they competing with the big how are they getting the records made and put in the stores and promoting well, had, it from my understanding they had to get with a distributor you know what i'm saying there was the distribution company here in atlanta one in um i remember in texas because i had to go to these places and shake hands with them yeah, you know, and meet them through pictures and autograph signings and stuff like that, and and some of the mom and pop stores, which I thought was a lot of it was a, amazing to go to the mom and pop stores because they was uh, my biggest supporters, you mm -hmm. know that that would take like independent record labels versus me signing with like a Sony or a Zumba or Jive yeah. Records at the time, yeah. who could get you right into those stores, but to get an independent. Um, artists in those stores, you had to really go out and shake a lot of hands. Yeah. And that, those are things at that time I really didn't understand. But as I got older, I'm like, oh, that's what y'all were doing. You know? Yeah. So yeah. A lot of sense. So, so, how, so how did how did so uh, how did the record do the the, the, well, so, the single and the album? Yeah. So I've heard several different things. You know. So the single when. When um, Cedric Hollywood and 102 Jams with Bartell, Bartell and the VJs there, they played the record. The record was like, this is Florida. This is a Orlando's own, you know, like a son of Orlando celebrating me for that. Here's Orlando's own. And it took off. Their sister stations in Miami, Jacksonville, Florida, Tampa, Florida, all of them started picking the record up and just copying it. So it was this burnt cassette tape that they had made. Even in the mom and pop stores, they were dubbing the record and selling it, just selling it as is because people were wanting the record. And all the way up through the Carolinas, I remember doing the show at BLS in New York. So it was spreading, taking off on its own. 
You know what I'm saying? They had the potential to be even bigger. Now, later on, I found out that um, other labels wanted to sign me. And that guy that used to go to Dr. Quinn's studio, he tried to help out with the record, as he told me later on, like recently later on. Yeah. That, hey, he was trying to get involved because he had a relationship with some of those labels that wanted to sign me, and they kind of, they rejected that. This Ripper Records didn't want to do the no, deal. They didn't want to do the deal. That's what I found out later on. Yeah. Okay. But it's, a, it, it's yeah. I no grudges anymore, but I was like, wow, is that, that's true? That, that's crazy. Even, even CC, the guy that was making a beat, he was like, they didn't tell you about this deal that they offered. So I don't know any of that yeah. you know, at that time. I'm just, I just wanted to make music and just keep it moving. But so they've yeah. given you a $5,000 advance. Your record is doing well. Are you seeing money coming in for, no, for that? I, just got, I got two more advances of five grand. Well, I got another advance for 5,000, another one for 1,000. And then for me to do this little independent small tour, I forget what the, the, the touring promoter was they advanced me like five thousand dollars to do like so many club shows mm. and i got that so a total of like 16 grand and then what was what, uh, the, the albums so, done out so then what? For, yeah so for the person that was working or the few people that was working in the label they were like there's a lot of things that are going on you know with this record you know Stuff of being sold on the table, stuff of been doing, you know, like I've heard a lot of the, those different things mm. where they, I've heard the single did 700,000, it sold a million copies. I've heard a lot. I don't know, man. You know what I'm saying? But at this point, I just knew I just wanted to do music and we'll take care of the rest later on. Not realizing that the business, like my mom said, should have been squared away from the beginning. But I felt like I didn't have that option. Mm. at all you know i just knew i needed to make it i was still catching the bus i was still catching the city bus around town with with the hottest record in orlando and the state of florida wow. and in a lot of cities and at that time um, they decided to sign another group who was hot who were friends of mine you know not at that time i kind of met them but they signed um the 69 boys who had this Song who, called Hoop That Is, yeah. Oh, no, 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 that's 95 South. They, oh, 95 South was signed to, uh, I believe it's, I want to say it was Itchy Bond at that time, but they were really close with Jay Ski at this point because Jay Ski did some pro he signed the 69 Boys, and the 69 Boys had this song called Tootsie Roll. Kai yeah, King. yeah, Tootsie Go. Roll. Let me see. I went to, I went to college in Alabama, so yeah. <laughs> you wanna, so, and you know, Alabama was big for yeah. us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Them, yeah, especially Dothan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in yeah. Selma, but yeah, Tootsie Roll. Yeah, they will do yeah. Tootsie Roll. Yeah. So we, they were constantly going up and down the highway with that record, and they sold millions of copies. And yeah, then yeah, I, no. that, they had a song on a movie soundtrack. They had, they had songs. Yeah, because I, I, when, when, you, when you talk a Ripper record, I, I, I was always associated it with the South because they were, so it did seem strange that you were on there because it seemed like that type of, they were doing the hip, they were doing that type of sudden yeah, hit music. rap. Yeah, so yeah. at that time, it was like the bass music. You think about what I said, Johnny said, things goes back in cycles of 10. When I was a kid playing Luke, you know, he had got a lot of heat because of how vulgar his music was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I called it honesty. People just liked it. That it was mm. party music. Yeah, I liked it, you know. Mm. I didn't know no better or what it was really talking about. But yeah. then that started to fade down. And then 95 South, when I was up here in Atlanta working with Kevin Kendricks, they were going to the clubs shopping their record, Whoop, There It Is. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, some DJs here was coming up with their saying, whoop, there it is, which was a group by the name of Tag Team. Tag yeah, Tag Team, team. Tag yeah. Team. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so both of those records came out at the same time. Tag Team Records was really big. And so was whoop, there it is. But yeah. in Atlanta, oh, yeah, they chose whoop, there it is because it was from here, you know. Yeah. So, which was so big. being being on the same label with the ninety six ninety five with with the with, with that track Tootsie Roll did that help you your career? I was the I was the only balladeer 
on that time, at, uh, of bass music at that time. I was the only person that was singing to bass music. It was different, it was unique. And I just felt like at that time, they really didn't know what to do with, what to do with me at that point. I felt like w they were trying, you know, I didn't know. I mean, you know, the bass music was just, it, it took off just like as fast as my record did. And you gotta think, my record foreplay was the only thing on my album that sounded like foreplay. That mm. whole album should have been revamped into other songs that led into that kind of stuff, you know? Mm.